Miss Trish Roberts is going to come and talk about Bible school a little bit. Father, we're so happy and so thankful to be here today and be able to worship you in spirit and truth. This is the day you made. We'll rejoice and be glad in it. We're so grateful, God, for our many blessings. All throughout this week, you've reminded us of your presence. You've answered our prayers. You've provided for our every single need. You've proven yourself again, Father, fresh and new as our Jehovah Jireh. And we thank you for that, God, and pray that you would be with each person here, whether they've been in this church for a while, or they're just visiting today, or just kind of just kind of wondering what you're doing, and just trying to find out where they should be in their life at this present time. We just pray, God, that you would be gracious to each one of us, merciful, and just speak to us clearly, lovingly, patiently, in a way that we can understand and respond to. Because we believe, God, that you're on the throne today, that you have everything under control, and that there's nothing that's going to happen this day that isn't first filtered through the nail-pierced hands of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're so thankful for that. And ask God that you would just help each one of us to submit our lives unto you today, knowing that whatever that means, it's the best. Your will is the best. Your way is the best. And we thank you for that, Father. And just pray again that you be with us as we worship and go through this time of preaching and teaching your word. And all throughout this day, We'll be constantly filled with the awe and wonder of what it means to be yours and to be loved by a God like you. So thankful, so grateful. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Now out in the foyer, as well as each Wednesday night at our outreach. 
going to bed. And we, the volunteers, thank you. Children's Church is dismissed. <laughs> Hey, let's now take your turn number 249. We'll sing all three of these. 249.
see one, two, and three here. If our ushers would please come to the last verse. One, two, and three.
be reconfiguring this stage area and getting it ready for the new carpet and the painting and everything that will follow after that. Uh, so if you want to help with that, see Larry Lewis, our chairman of the deacons, or Brett Jock, who's in charge of our trustees, or call the church office and say, hey, I want to help. We'll put a wrench in your hand <laughs> as we do that. I think somebody said something about maybe we'll have lunch that day too, but uh, I, I think we can probably work something out for that. So that's uh, kind of synopsized here on the back at the bottom, what's going on during the month of August. And as I said, we'll get a letter out here in a week or so. Don't want to overshadow Bible school too much. We've got a lot on our plates and a lot of plates on our table right now. <laughs> so be, please be in prayer about all that stuff. And uh, ask God what he'd have you to do in helping us out during this summer season of outreach. All right, Luke chapter 16. Let's turn there this morning. Good to see you all. Glad you're able to be with us today. If you're a visitor, don't feel like a visitor. Just relax. Enjoy yourself. See what God will do. We're reading Luke 16, 19 through the end of the chapter. Luke 16, beginning in verse 19. There was a certain rich man, clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed from the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember, you in your lifetime receive good things. Lazarus evil thing. Now he's comforted and you're tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed. So that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. He said, nay, Father Abraham, but if one went with them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. In this passage, Jesus pulls back the curtain of eternity and lets us see what happens after death. It's the best section of scripture I can find to summarize what Jesus said about heaven and what Jesus said about hell. If you've been around here a while, we've got all the 13 week studies on heaven and hell and the afterlife and those types of things. So it's, it's quite complex, quite detailed. But this story gives us some pictures that we can sort of hang on. There's basically three viewpoints on eternity, on the afterlife. There is the atheistic or the materialistic viewpoint. That is, you and I are just blobs of protoplasm. We were just biological gobbledygook that somehow got together one time and morphed into this and evolved into this and developed into this, and here we are. And so we're like higher animals, and we were born biologically. All we are is biological. There's nothing spiritual about us. There is no afterlife. There is no God. And so when you die, you're just dead. Uh, John Lennon, you remember John? He said, imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell beneath us and above us only sky. And then he said something very insightful. He didn't know what he said. He said, imagine all the people living in the world. Today. His buddy Paul said, when you die, you just conk out. Maybe Paul is 
refracted his opinion since the last I read Paul, and hopefully John did something before that bullet ended his life in 1980. But the truth is, there are a large number of people that believe that we're just higher forms of animals. We're born, we live, you know, this is the only thing there is. You know, grab all the gusto, you know, make all you can, can all you get, and sit on the can. You know, that's what some people live. That is their modus operandi. That is their motive for living. The atheistic viewpoint. Then there's the pantheistic viewpoint, which is Eastern religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, and so forth. And that is, we've always been alive. Reincarnation. We're born and we lived a previous life as something or someone and we come into this life and, and we live a good life or a bad life and we create a karma. And that karma goes into our next life and we just keep going around and around and around like a sock in the dryer until one day the sock disappears. You ever have a sock disappear in the dryer? Me too. But the goal of the pantheistic viewpoint of the afterlife is to become nothing be absorbed into nirvana or brahman or whatever the perspective is. But that is another viewpoint of the afterlife, is the idea of just the transmigration of the soul. And for those of us who have a Christian viewpoint of the afterlife, of eternity, we would have a certain dogma, a certain doctrine that Jesus is going to flesh out for us here in just a minute if we ever get to it. But the, the Eastern mystics would say, my karma just ran over your dogma. And I would say, well, my Jesus rose from the dead. What would your Buddha do? So there is the atheistic viewpoint. You live, you die, you're dead. There is the pantheistic viewpoint. You just keep going around and around and around and around until you become nothing. But then there's what Jesus said, which is the theistic viewpoint. And he said that both heaven and hell are, number one, real places where people exist, and number two, real states of existence where people see, know, sense, feel, and they both last forever and ever and ever. Now, write this down because I've got a lot to say in a short time to say. As you read the whole evidence in the Bible about the afterlife, about eternity, about these two places called heaven and hell, you see that the afterlife, the doctrine of eternity, has three stages of development. There's the immediate, there's the intermediate, and there's the ultimate. Now, this story describes the immediate afterlife, the Old Testament understanding of heaven and hell, of eternity. Everything changes when Jesus goes to the cross and rises from the grave. I'll get to that in a minute. But Jesus is telling a story simply reflecting the Old Testament teaching and understanding about what happens when a person dies, the heaven and hell, the afterlife, the eternity. In the Old Testament time, the godly people, Abraham, Moses, David, Malachi, Ruth, Esther, all of these Bible heroes that we know, people that believed in the one true God, when they died, as this Lazarus character, this beggar man died, they are taken to a place called Abraham's bosom, also called paradise. Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. So there was a section in this place of the afterlife called Abraham's bosom, are paradise. That's where the godly Old Testament believers went. That's where their spirits went. The body, of course, is dead. The body without the spirit is dead. You stop breathing, you're dead. <laughs> so that was that side. And then the rich man, he's in the other side, which is called hell, or the, the Hebrew term, uh, sort of Greek, or, or brought into the Greek is Gehenna. Gehenna which was the trash heap or the trash dump. It's the place that burned all day long. They didn't have any way to sanitarily get rid of their refuse and to keep germs and bacteria and diseases down. The dump burned all the time. So everybody understood Gehenna. It was the dump. It was a place that always burned, but it never burned up. Jesus would use this word. So this Old Testament afterlife eternal place was called Sheol, or the place of departed spirits. Sometimes in the Bible it's called hell, sometimes it's called death, sometimes it's called the grave. There are different English terms that are translated by this uh, Hebrew word sheol. The point is, as you notice from the story, there is a great gulf or a chasm between the godly side of the immediate eternity, the Old Testament eternity, and the ungodly side. But once you go to one side or the other, your fate is fixed. 
from the very beginning of the teaching of the Bible, which Jesus just stamped with his uh, stamp, there was the idea that you live and you die and your eternal nature, state, existence is fixed. No second chances, no do-overs, none of that kind of stuff. So it's this life, what do we do with God, and then it's eternity. That's why it's so important to make sure that you're right with God now, Amen. in this life, yeah. today. Because eternity is a long, long time. And a hundred years from now, you'll never regret obeying the Lord Jesus Christ. Either receiving Him as Savior, submitting your life to Him in some way, sacrificing and surrendering something that you think is so important that He tells you to let go so that you may follow Him and deepen your life with Him. A hundred years from now, you won't be there and say, Bummer. <laughs> Why didn't I give that up? No, you'd just be praising the Lord so much more. So, Sheol, Old Testament, eternal understanding, the immediate heaven. That's what Jesus is picturing here. The second stage of heaven is what I call the intermediate afterlife. That is now. That's where we're living now. The immediate, the Old Testament is over. We're living in the intermediate understanding of the afterlife. And the ultimate is not yet. Get to that in a minute. Stay with me. I thought you had a lot to say. Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. Every single one. And not our sins only, John will tell us in 1 John 2, 2, but the sins of the whole world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life, John 3, 16. So when he died on the cross, he was dead. His body was laid in a tomb, as you know. But in the spirit, Jesus went into this place called Sheol. If you're familiar with the Apostle Creed, or if you came from a mainline church, a UCC, or some Presbyterian Methodist, they, they have catechisms that say Jesus descended into hell. That's what they're talking about. It, it's not the teaching of Kenneth Copeland and some other people, I won't mention names because I don't want everybody's feelings, that Jesus didn't fully pay for our sins on the cross, that he had to go down here and duke it out with the devil in some kind of WWF thing, some Hollywood thing, some Hollywood thing. And him and the devil are duking it out. He's got to beat the devil and take the souls he paid for it all on the cross when he said it is finished. You know what he's talking about. Amen. <laughs> but he did descend into the lower parts of the earth. And he scooped up that godly side, that Abraham's bosom side, that paradise side. And he took them up into heaven and he left that rich man. And by the way, the rich man wasn't in hell because he was rich. And the poor man went to heaven because he was poor. Riches can be a detriment to receiving Christ, but I know m many godly rich people who have done great things for the kingdom of God. If you had a choice today between godly and rich or godly and poor, I'd take godly and rich every time. <laughs> Think how much good I could do in the Philippines or Honduras with a bucket load of money. So if God gives you a choice, go the rich way. And I know some poor people, mean as a snake. So it just goes to the two people that Jesus chose to talk about. But he left the rich man and every other person who had ever lived up to that time who rejected the one true God in the place we commonly call today hell. He took the godly side up into what we call today heaven, and he presented in the heavenly sanctuary his own blood. Hebrews 8 and 9. Read it sometime. When Lucifer... <coughs> Satan, when Lucifer rebelled against God, he corrupted the heavenly place in heaven, the holy sanctuary in heaven. He corrupted it. He dirtied it. He soiled it. He messed it up. But Jesus, when he went back above into heaven, presented his own blood and cleansed not only our sins at the cross, but our sins in heaven. And now he sits on the right hand of God and he intercedes for you and I. So we know, those of us who know the Lord, we're not only saved by the power of God, we're kept by the power of God. <laughs> I'm going to get happy here in a minute. And then he led what Ephesians 4 calls captivity captive. He led them up. Those who were captive down here waiting for that day of redemption for them. He led them up 
into that heavenly place. Matthew 27 says, after Jesus arose, some of them even appeared in the streets of Jerusalem. Here's some guy walking along. Hey, there's Uncle Joe. I thought he died last year. There we go. It was funny. It would have been groovy. True. So the Bible now says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. If you're in the Lord, every person is either in Jesus or in Adam. I'll say more about that in a minute. So a person who is trusted in Christ, the very instant they breathe their last breath here, they breathe their first breath there. That's the hope of heaven. That's the comfort we have. The person, unfortunately, who rejects, and there were two thieves with Jesus, one rejected, remember. That person, the instant they breathe their last here, they breathe their first in the place so aptly described here by a man who's been there for thousands of years. A man who looked like he had it all, but he had it all most. That's the difference between heaven and hell. The difference between all and almost. Hebrews 9.27 says, It's appointed unto man once to die in the judgment, and we face God. It's here Tuesday night, we was playing music in preparation for Wednesday night, and the phone rang, and I thought it was Cardinal Hospital, probably, and it was a Pinkerville Hospital. And uh, the nurse asked me if I could come. There was a man there from Percy area who was on hospice and was in the process of leaving this world. They couldn't find any hospice chaplains, so I guess I was the next best thing. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding, Eva. <laughs> Eva can tell you, they call me a lot. Uh, hospitals and funeral homes are always calling you. What does that mean? I don't know. But anyway, uh, I went into the room. There were about nine people there, his brothers, his mother, some young people that I didn't really know who they were, but they were all there. Of course, I'm a total stranger, feeling very inferior, intimidated. No matter how many times you do this kind of thing, you never feel adequate or qualified. It's just, it's just weird. <laughs> and uh, the, the man who was passing away, just a couple years older than me, and a shell of a man because of the cancer and the fight. The fight to live is incredibly strong, some of you know. And I just walked up to him and I laid my hand on his chest and I took him by the hand and I said, Jerry, my name is Rob. And I'm preacher, and I just hear, and I said, Jerry, do you know the Lord? And he just groaned, you know, and there was no audible verification that even understood what I said. Then I just began to quote scripture to him, you know, uh, the, the blessings of salvation, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, and by grace we're saved through faith, and that not of ourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, let anyone should hope. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, and, and uh, let not your heart be troubled in my father's house or many mansions, and I must have gone on for about ten minutes, you know. I don't know what everybody behind me thought. We're going to get a sermon here, I guess they thought. And then I prayed for Jerry, and spent 15 or 20 minutes with the family, and the hospice nurse came in, and she was very gracious, and thanked me, and then she sent me home. <laughs> I was glad. And then uh, before the sun came up, Jerry went into eternity. What happened to Jerry? I don't know. I don't know. But that's the truth of heaven and hell in the, what I'm calling the intermediate, in the prison. We live this life. We've all sinned. All of us is guilty, guilty of sin, guilty of sin. And yet God loves us and he sent his son to take our place, to take our punishment, to take our penalty because the wages of sin is death. We receive Jesus Christ, it's hell. If we reject Jesus Christ, it's hell. Number three, got to get moving. There's the ultimate heaven. Now beyond this, Jesus is going to rapture the church. Could happen at any moment. It's impending. It's imminent. Watch Israel. Watch what's going on in the world. Jesus Christ is one day going to have that angel blow that trumpet, and we're out of here. <laughs> in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the Bible says. And then all hell is going to break out on planet Earth. Out of seven-year period, three divided by three and a half years, tribulation, great tribulation, a lot of stuff. Don't have time to go into that. And then Jesus returns with us, Revelation 19, sets up his kingdom on the earth for a thousand years. Satan is bound, and we live here and rule as his co-regents. 
After that thousand year period, Satan is loose for a little season. He finds men still ready to rebel against the one who sits upon the center throne of the universe, ruling with a rod of iron, Psalm chapter 2. And uh, Jesus puts down that little coup d'etat quite quickly. And then it's the eternal state where we're completely ushered into the blessedness of heaven, Revelation 21 and 22. No more sin, no more sorrow, no more separation, no more death, no more pain, no more sickness. And every tear is wiped away. Praise his name. Hallelujah. Then Revelation 20 talks about the great white throne judgment. That's the ultimate of hell. Where every ungodly, unbelieving person who's ever lived, from the Stalins and the Hitlers and the Genghis Khans and the serial murderers and the perverts and the psychos and the demon worshipers, all the way to your neighbor who watches your cats when you go on vacation, or give you the shirt off his back. There's a good guy who volunteers at the Humane Society who gives blood every time the blood mobile comes to town. That guy too. Everybody who's rejected Jesus Christ will stand before Revelation 20, 11 through 15, the great white throne judgment. And all the books will be opened, all the things they did, all the accomplishments, all the achievements, all the accolades. And they think that's going to get them in. They think that's going to be enough. But the very thing they think is evidence to get them into heaven is evidence to send them into hell. Because there's another book. And it's called the Book of Life. And they're going to be led to that book in stunned silence before an almighty holy God. And they're going to see that when they were born, God wrote their name in that book because they're a person of great value and worth, precious in the sight of a loving heavenly father. But then they're going to see that there was a day when they died and their name was blotted out of that book. And only the people whose names are in the book of life will experience the ultimate joys of heaven. And those who are blotted out will be sentenced to the fires and the isolation of hell. It was C.S. Lewis that said, hell is man saying to God, leave me alone, and God saying to man, you have your wish. You have your wish. Now today, there are two deceptive lies being taught and accepted concerning heaven and hell, concerning the doctrine of eternity. Number one, universalism. That is, since Jesus died on the cross for everyone, everyone goes to heaven. Let me say something that's going to make some people mad. I'm not saying it to make you mad, but it mad maybe it'll wake you up. A lot of people in Southern Baptist churches are universalists, practically. They would agree theologically, Jesus died, people need to repent, they need to be born again, but they never share the gospel with anybody. They just sort of hope their loved ones get to heaven someday. They just sort of hope their friends make it to heaven someday. They just sort of hope their co-workers get to heaven someday. I've done funerals, and I say, did he go, Lord, well, I hope so. You tell him. If you had the cure for cancer, wouldn't you share it with a person who was dying of cancer? If you had a million dollars, wouldn't you give some to somebody who was bankrupt to lose their? Wouldn't you do something? Don't you realize the greatest sin of the Christian today is the sin of not sharing Jesus Christ with people that need to know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now listen to me. No, no, no guilt trips here. None of us can save everybody. None of us is Jesus Jr., mini Messiah, running everywhere trying. But God will lead you, if you submit your life to him, God will lead you to people that you can touch, that you can talk to, that you can plant seeds in, that you can answer questions with, that you can send a card to, that you can minister to. And if each one of us would be fervently, faithfully obedient to obey what God has told us to do, this church would be revolutionized. And every church would be revolutionized. Universalism. But you see, it's the same word that says eternal life that says eternal separation. So whatever eternal life is to the good, eternal separation is 
to the bad. You can't, those who teach universalism and, and, and believe that everybody's going to get into heaven somehow because God's just so wonderful, and he is. They don't want to deal with those verses that clearly teach a distinction. Of course, what story did we just read? Jesus himself, written in red, said there's a distinction. The other lie that's being taught, the other deception, is not universalism, but annihilationism. That is, people don't suffer eternally. There's a point where God just <laughs> eliminates them. They stand before the great white throne judgment, they hear the sentence, and the lake of fire is like a bug flying into a bug light. A lot of cults teach that. Very attractive to think about ungodly, wicked, evil people. Those that have, have done deviant and dastardly things to people. That they would just stand before God and then they cease to exist. But the Bible teaches clearly eternal life, eternal separation. Clearly. Clearly. Now look at verse 27 with me. We're almost done. I know this has been an intense excursus. Somebody get that phone. <laughs> Somebody call and say, Lee, please shut up. <laughs> Five more minutes. Five more minutes. To prove my point and to emphasize why we're doing outreaches, why we're trying to get to know our neighbors, why we're trying to connect, why we're trying to make the emphasis of what we're doing, handing these New Testaments to people and showing them the plan of salvation, and opening ourselves up and inviting them to come and sit and, and trying to do these things is because Jesus told us to go. Yeah. Jesus came and he died on the cross for our sins. And he didn't say, now you just hang around till heaven, because everybody's going to heaven anyway. He said, you've got to go. You've got to go. You've got to go. You've got to take the good news that your sins are forgiven, forgotten, forever, and you've got to share that with people I lead you to. As you're going, Matthew 28, participle, as you're going, just here and there, as God opens the door, it's so beautiful, it's so wonderful, it's so supernaturally natural. To just, hey, can I tell you something? Hey, could I talk to you about the day that changed my life? Hey, could I share something with you that I've really wanted to say for a long time? It's, it's as God leads you. as He gives you opportunity. Some people are, are big talkers, and they like to, to, to chew the fat. they got the gift of death. Other people are writers, and they're card senders. And whatever your personality is, God will baptize it with the power of the Holy Spirit and use you for his glory in a way you never dreamed possible if you'll let it. Jesus said, go. Jesus is in heaven saying, go, go, go. But in verse 27, you've got a man in hell saying, go, go, go. Couldn't hardly read it. Couldn't hardly read it. Without getting emotional. you got a man in hell saying, please send somebody. Please send somebody. I'll tell you what. Father Abraham, if, if Lazarus would just rise from the dead and they saw him, the people in the old neighborhood, my brothers and all my old peeps, my posse, <laughs> they wouldn't want to come here. Remember there was another Lazarus? Jesus resurrected him. <coughs> Chapter 11, John. Chapter 12, you know what they were trying to do? Kill him again. Go <laughs> read it sometime. Here he is sitting with Jesus in John chapter 12, and people are coming around talking to the guy that was dead. Now he's alive. And the religious leader said, we've got to find a way to get rid of him. That's what Father Abraham, who's on the other side, more knowledge than you and I have. He says, they've got the word of God. At this time, Moses and the prophets. Now we've got the New Testament too. He said, if they won't listen to my word, they wouldn't even believe if somebody rose from the dead. I could tell stories, 30 years of this, I could tell stories of people who claim they've been healed or they've seen God do this or God answered them, and, and, and they don't believe in God. They're not walking with God. They're not living right. They're not living holy. They're not in a church, but they claim that God did this or that or the other. They've seen God do stuff, but they've never submitted their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. They've never bowed the knee. They've never humbled the heart. They've never allowed the redemptive power of the Holy Spirit into their minds. They know about God. They have a knowledge of God. 
They go to some churches. They got some beliefs, but they have not been born again. And because of that, they're going to hell. But that can be remedied in an instant. In an instant. Today, the Bible says, is the day of salvation. If you hear his voice, harden not your heart, Paul says in Corinthians. Today's all you've got. This is it. This is it. As most of you know, my wife has been very sick for some time. I doubt very seriously that most of you have any idea how sick she was or has been. But uh, on Friday night, I was here at a wedding this weekend and just did the wedding rehearsal. And was on the way out, called mom. Mom had Wyatt. Wyatt's our four year old, if you don't know from the mom and Mom and dad had Wyatt. So I'd be right there. Well, I no longer hung up and the phone rang and it was my wife. She said, you need to come down here, Carbondale Hospital. I said, why? She said, I have lung cancer. And uh, the doctor had come in. I'd been there all day waiting for him to come in. We'd had a test done on Thursday, waiting for the results of it. But I had to get up here because people are getting married. <laughs> so anyway, I called mom and family, went down to the house, called mom and dad, and went down there. And I walked into the room, 402. And uh, gave my wife a big hug, and she cried a lot. And uh, after, oh, 30, 45 seconds, she sort of gathered herself, and I got off top of her, and uh, tears streaming down her face. And the first thing she said to me was, I wanted 50 years with you. And I said to her, all we have is right now. All you have is right now. So this is a right now moment for everybody here. If you need to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, it's a right now moment. If you need to repent of sin and come back to Him in some way, you've not been walking to Him, with Him, you've not been talking to Him, you've not been living like a Christian, you've not been doing like you should, it's a right now moment for you. If God is speaking to you about something else and you need to respond to him, anything, in your marriage, in your family, in your life, it's a right now moment. And some people right now are saying about this right now moment. I've been in a lot of these right now moments. I've heard these preachers say this kind of stuff for years. One day, it'll be over. <laughs> and as I said, you'll never regret one minute, a hundred years from now, how you responded to God in those right now moments. Jesus said, in this passage, there is a heaven. There is a hell. But in between, there's now. There's the life that we have to live for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, right now. is all we have. And so right now, Father, I would pray that if there are any here that need to respond to you today, they would do that. They'd put away pride. They'd stop making excuses. They would simply submit their lives to you today, right here, right now, to receive Christ as Savior, to present themselves for baptism, to become part of this church family, to serve you in some way, to repent of sin that they've tolerated and made excuses for for a long time to begin living more righteously and holily than they ever had before, knowing that one day they're going to meet you, that you're a gracious, merciful, but you're also a God that's full of justice. Father, I pray for those that are, are just settling for a little bit less than God's best. They got to a certain point in their walk, they got to a certain point in their life, and they sort of let off a little bit. And yet you have blessings for them. You have things you want to do in their lives, and they're so close that they just keep walking. Lord, I know there's an enemy. His name is the devil, and I know he's acting in many different ways. But I pray at this time that these people sitting here today would listen to your voice and simply do what you say, whatever that is, that you might be glorified. 
and that they may feel your presence like they never had before and know your pleasure in them. That when we don't do as we should, when, when we don't respond like we know, you don't condemn us. You're just grieved for us because we've just said, no, God, I don't want it your way. I want it my way. No, God, I, I, I think I can do better than what you've got planned. And he knows that the best plan of all is when we just say yes. And, of course, that means trust. And, Father, that's hard for some people. But that verse that says, absent from the body, present with the Lord, is preceded by a verse that says, we walk by faith and not by sight. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not unto your own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes, fear the Lord, and depart from evil. And that's what I'm inviting you to do this morning as we come to this time of invitation. As God leads, if you need to come, you can do that today. Top what number? 324. Let's stand together. In number 324, let's stand together and sing. God is calling you and you come. 324.
Remind us, Lord, that our greatest ministry will come through how we choose to accept our deepest misery. All of us have been wounded. All of us have been hurt. All of us have been in darkness and felt lonely. All of us have said, I can't do it. I can't go on. I can't make it. But we know there's a Savior sitting in heaven praying for us. Saying, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. You're never alone. Everything you need, I've got. And I'll give it to you when I'm ready. When it's time. Trust me. Walk with me. Talk to me. Let me be more God than you've ever experienced. Because I'm more God than you'll ever need. David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. A long time ago, God, you told me that means three words. I just pray, God, for you people today as we go our ways. You just fill us again with the wonder and awe of what it means to be yours and what it means to be loved by a God like you. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. 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 God bless you. You are dismissed. <laughs>